It's quite easy to say to one self or to another. It's quite easy to say uh, the self ultimately is an illusion, and so therefore I should let go of it. Uh, easy, easy to say that. Um, but the question, as practitioners, is how how really to see this deeply, really deeply in a way that penetrates the heart and penetrates the consciousness and penetrates the life and the being and brings with it transformation and freedom. That's the question. So we've talked just so far in this retreat, we've, uh, we've gone about this uh, emptiness of the self from already from a couple of different directions at least. Um, one is, for instance, in the letting go, letting be practice, l- letting go of aversion and pushing and pulling, etc., beginning to see how the self-sense is dependent, it's not fixed, it's actually dependent on aversion and clinging, on making something a big deal. It's not solidly, substantially existing by itself. It takes some kind of building and creating. In the anatta practice that we've been doing, <clears throat> remember... Th- th- it's quite subtle. What we're actually doing is we're finding a way of looking at, looking a way of looking at phenomena as not self, not me, not mine, of, of not identifying uh, with phenomena. It's a way of relating to phenomena in the present moment. And uh, people have been asking, you know, if if kind of labeling or mental noting not self or whatever it is not me not my if that helps great but what we're really doing is setting up a way of seeing and encouraging the kind of sustaining of a way of seeing of phenomena in the present moment as they unfold what i want to talk about tonight is another option and tonight i want to introduce a practice a possibility of a practice which is actually not so much looking at phenomenon and phenomena uh, and uh, letting go of identification there, but actually looking for this self. Not looking at phenomena, looking for the self. And realizing that no matter where I look, any conceivable place that I look, I actually cannot find this self. So, in, in the unfolding of all of this over, over four weeks, and, and really probably actually more later after the retreat, if you, if you pursue some of this, as some of you will, we begin to see how these practices actually feed each other and really reinforce each other and strengthen each other. Uh, so if, if we just take the anatta practice for a second, this, this uh, learning to disidentify, to unhook the identification, what happens, as we've been describing, is we get gradually, with that practice, get familiar with, with that space that opens up and that disidentification and learn to dwell in it and the fear begins to, gradually, for most people, uh, we get less and less afraid of, of, of unhooking that identification. And more and more um, familiar and less afraid of the sense of self getting a bit quiet and the letting go that happens. This practice tonight, um, <coughs> it, it can feed into that whole process by filling out uh, the, the fuller meaning of of the anatta practice and the sense of anatta and the kind of reasoning behind it. So I hope that becomes clear as I speak. So there was, we've already mentioned him, there was <coughs> a, a very, very significant uh, great teacher in 7th century India, uh, the abbot of Nalanda a Monastery uh, University, and his name was Chandrakirti, we've mentioned him. And he was the one, uh, as far as I, I'm aware, who really... Um, elaborated on this particular practice and really filled it out. But actually, it has its roots. I found it in the Pali Canon, and I think it's, um, I think it's in one of the verses of uh, 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 an Arahant nun, an awakened nun, and she just briefly mentions uh, mentions this practice or this way of seeing the self. <clears throat> Chandra Kirti is famous because he takes the image of a chariot chariot and he kind of takes it apart and says you can't actually find the chariot okay and that the roots of that are actually uh, from this nun uh, sometime obviously hundreds of years before <coughs> but he fills it out so tonight as I go into this and try and explain um, options for you here there's a lot of options so one option is that you really get interested in this and you learn it 
as a meditation practice. Keywords are meditation and practice. Learn it as a meditation practice. So this is not an exercise in philosophy alone. And then that practice, like all other practices we've been talking about, and I've been talking about, is is something we develop. There's the potential to develop that and develop the power of it and our skill and our, our capacity with it. It might be you listen and you just feel like, I don't know, maybe I like the sound of it, maybe I don't like the sound of it, but I'm going to file it for later. Totally fine. Totally fine to listen that way, with just a sense of trying to follow, trying to understand, maybe taking notes if you want, but filing it for later and being very clear about that. And it might be that you find yourself just listening and, and uh in, in that just listening, without even maybe thinking that we're going to file it for later, there, uh, the seeds may be planted. Uh, the seeds may be planted, and as I said, they will have their effect in some way. Um, I hope that as I'm speaking, as I'm giving this talk, the whole of yesterday's talk is also present in your consciousness in a perfectly accessible way. <laughs> as is uh, the whole of uh, tomorrow's evening's talk. <laughs> it's impossible to say everything at once. Um, I actually wish the whole four weeks were all at once, because there's ways that everything fits together, but particularly last night's and tomorrow night's, so um, get those psychic powers going. <laughs> um, I, I have to give them in some order, into it, whatever. <coughs> uh, I think in the... In, a couple of times I've been talking, I've used the word analysis, and I've just thrown that out without really explaining what it means. Um, this is an example of analysis, of meditative analysis, and you'll come across that if you read uh, certain texts, quite common. But again, uh, we can analyse philosophically and logically, and that's what part of this is about. <coughs> um, so the analysis here is using reasoning, using, using the logical mind, using the reasoning faculty, to refute, which means, it's a fancy word for disprove, to disprove the inherent existence of the self, of the I or the self. And when we say analysis in meditation, uh, that's what analysis means in terms of meditation on emptiness. Um, but the key word again is meditation. It needs, the medita it needs us to be able to uh, bring this... Uh, what sounds like a philosophical, logical analysis, which actually is, bring it in, into a meditative mind and use it meditatively, and out of that the freedom comes. Just thinking about it won't do much. Just uh, kind of playing with concepts, not going to do much, not going to bring that deep freedom and transformation. So to remember, uh, to go back a few, maybe one of the first talks, we're refuting the inherent existence of the self. And that means that there is a self that actually exists by itself, in itself, from its own side, independently in some way. And that's the, the intuitive sense that we have of the self. It exists in its own right. So, the first step, of this, uh, it's three steps to this, this practice, and it can seem a little clunky at first, but as we develop it gets much easier, much smoother. The first step <coughs> of the three is technically, the technical language is ascertaining the object to be negated. Okay, so that sounds like a mouthful. What it really means is getting in touch with this sense of the self getting in touch, when we look inside and we introspect and we feel the sense of self, that for the most part we feel it as something exactly that, that's inherently existing, that exists independently by itself, somehow here. The world can do whatever it wants, but the self is still here. And, and getting that sense, feeling that sense of the self in that way. Uh, does that make sense? Getting that sense of it, which is the usual intuitive sense that human beings have of, of, of their self. Actually, most consciousnesses have of, of their selves. Um, there's a... I think it was from the... Well, I'm not sure when he died, maybe 20, 20th century sometime. Uh, um, it was an abbot called Gawang Belden, a very famous Tibetan teacher. He said, if the sense of the self as inherently existing isn't actually clear, doing the analysis and meditating on the emptiness of it is a bit like shooting an arrow when you don't know, you've no idea where the target is. 
you actually don't know what you're shooting at. The chances of success there, actually seeing the emptiness of this thing, are not very strong. So it's actually important to take a little time, we've talked before, but a few talks about the sense of self, and really getting the sense how it, it appears, it feels to me, for all my life, it feels to me as something independently and inherently existent. Um, so, and again, going back quite a number of talks, uh, it's not just that we want, in, in meditating on emptiness, to withdraw the sense, uh, withdraw contact with that sense of self and kind of let everything just go kind of fuzzy or empty, so to speak. So what, we're, what we're doing here is something different. We're uh, actually aiming at something and deliberately s seeing that it cannot exist the way it appears to exist which is different than just going to sleep and not having much of a sense of self when you're dreamless sleep or going into deep samadhi, although that's important too. So it's, it's actually looking right at this sense of inherent self and, and seeing it cannot, it cannot actually logically stand up as an entity. Okay, now, if we talk about the inherent existing of the self or disproving it, that sounds intellectual to say the self exists inherently, like it's some philosophical postulation that a person saying, I believe the self exists inherently, and someone says, I don't believe that. What we're talking about is not on the level of logic. We're talking about uh, in your blood, in your bones, uh, we feel the self as inherently existent. So, you know, when push comes to shove in life, and so someone points at you in a crowd and says, you thief, or whatever it is, or someone threatens you, or you're angry, that the sense of self is, is palpable in that way. But even sometimes when it gets quieter, it's still there as a sense of inherently existing. We want to get familiar with that. So I'm not talking about a philosophical position, I'm talking about a very intuitive, innate sense of, of the self existing that way. Then in terms of this practice, or this contemplation, this analysis, what it's really doing is investigating the relationship of the self and the aggregates, the, the khandhas, the uh, body uh, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. It's investigating that relationship. <clears throat> now, if we think about that relationship a little bit, <clears throat> we don't walk around thinking this is this is actually quite important. None of this we think about. We don't naturally uh, think of the self as, um, say, one with the aggregates or among the aggregates. We don't walk around with that philosophical view, or we don't walk around with the opposite view of it's separate from the aggregates, it's different from the aggregates. But what the, what this analysis is doing is actually saying something different. Yes, we don't walk around that way thinking that. However, if, if the self had inherent existence, which is what it feels to have, if it had inherent existence, it would have to be, it would have to be, if it had inherent existence, either somehow one with the aggregates or among the aggregates, or somehow separate or different from the aggregates. Okay. Now that's quite a thing to assent to, so to say, yes, that's true. It's quite a thing. When I, when I, f yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, hopefully, I'm gonna explain. Okay, I don't, this is really good. I don't want to know what you mean by that. Okay, aggregates are the, the khandas is the Pali word, or skandas is the Sanskrit word, and it's um, body, feelings, the sense of uh, uh, feeling unpleasant, pleasant, neutral, um, perceptions, uh, mental formations can mean thoughts, intentions, uh, etc., moods, uh, and consciousness. And all of that, those are the five possible things that it's likely for us to identify with. You know, so we identify with the body, we identify with our moods, we identify with our thoughts, or consciousness or something. Okay? So it's one possible way. So we could divide the, we could divide a human being into body and mind, and then say, uh, that's a possible division. We could also divide it into five aggregates. There's many divisions we could give, there's many ways we could divide a human being if we want to. So if I can refute this sameness or difference, I mean, it's either among or it's separate from, then I must necessarily refute the inherent uh, existence of, of uh, the self. Okay. Now, when I first heard that, I couldn't swallow that. It was actually quite, quite hard to swallow. It seemed too simplistic 
to me. Um, with time, it seems less so. But so, what this practice does is it actually fills that out. It fills that out. In a, the yeah, there. then I'm refuting the inherent existence of the self because if the self necess- if the self inherently exists, it must be either among the aggregates or separate from the aggregates, the same as the aggregates or different than the aggregates. Why? Well, okay, I'm going to go in. I'm going to one second. I'm going to. Um, I, I don't expect you to be happy with what I just said. As I said, I wasn't happy with it first. Some people might be. What the, what this what I'm going to go into tonight fills it all out, okay? And is that step two, the, the refusing that you just mentioned? It's half a step two. It's not quite, because I haven't quite finished yet. So perhaps I could just finish this little thing and then... Just, just yeah. a, a relationship. When In one of John's talks, mm-hmm. he said that Ananda was asking him yeah. this. And he said, can you control this? Uh-huh. Is that the same thing? Can you control mm-hmm. this? Is that the same dialogue um, it's maybe part of it but it's a slightly different direction so I, I have to I have to fill this out f- to, for you to get most probably there's there's most most of you will not have heard a lot of this before it will be quite especially from from an insight meditation background this whole way of going about meditation or Zen background this whole way of going about meditation and and this particular thread of reasoning you won't have heard before the people that were here last year will have gone through it, but for, for a lot of you, be, be quite new as a whole way of approaching things. So, um, that splitting it into two, it's either the same as aggregates or, or separate, among the aggregates or separate. What, what I'm trying to introduce tonight, uh, in terms of this chariot thing of Chandrakirti, is actually breaking that into seven and looking at seven possible ways the self could exist. So it has a name, it's called the sevenfold reasoning. Sevenfold reasoning. Uh, sevenfold reasoning. And uh, for me, when I first got into this, yeah, I couldn't really buy what I just said, but once going into the seven reasons, it actually seemed much more, uh, yeah, I could, I could get behind that a bit more. Um, and to me, that was much more thorough. It seemed a much more thorough and convincing sort of, which I'm going to unfold. So, this is saying if the the, the sort of thesis or whatever it's called uh, is now, if the self inherently exists, it has to exist in one of these seven ways, and there aren't any pos- other possibilities. It has to exist in one of these seven ways, and they are. Uh, well, Chandrakirti was talking about chariot, but it tra- the chariot and its parts translate as the self and the aggregates. Uh, so, if I move between these two, I hope it's still clear, right? So, if, if it gets unclear, stop me. So, chariot and parts are a kind of practice uh, warm-up for self and aggregates, okay? So, Chandrakirti. A chariot is not findable as one or some of its parts. So we could say a self is not findable as one or some of its aggregates. Is this... Sorry, I'm really lost. This is, is this first step okay. of seven? Which no, no, is good. Okay, two? thank you. All right. So this is... Um, uh, I'm just explaining it, and I will then move on to what the second step is. Okay? So this is the, the first step of the seven ways. Um, n- this is the o- part of the overview, yeah. Because you said step one was ascertaining the object to be negated. Exactly. No, that's step one of three. Yes. Yeah. Step one of... Th- okay, yeah, good, thank you. So, sorry, I sh- meant to... Meant to, I thought before the talk I need to explain this. So there's three steps. The third step has seven parts. Oh, okay, so se- now... I haven't <laughs> said the second... <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. It's my fault, my fault. My fault. Three steps... The third animal men <laughs> three <laughs> um, th- third um, the third step has seven parts right now i 've just introduced the first step and I'm, um, uh, i haven 't said what the second step is, but i 'm in the process of explaining it, and as part of that i 'm just going to throw out what the seven steps are 
Okay, and then I'm going to go into them as part of explaining the third step in more, more, more detail. So, the second step, am I right in thinking it's, if I can refute the self as either among the scandals or not, then it can't have an independent system. So yeah, yeah. okay, but uh, let's say that's the second step. Yeah. Okay, in that, but what the second step fully is, is really being convinced of that. And, and, and so the second, I'll repeat it from what April said. Um, it's the technical language is ascertaining the pervasion. Okay, yeah. Ascertaining the pervasion. It has to do with... This is step two. Okay. Guys, don't... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, it's going to sound really complicated, uh, or it might sound really... Which is partly why I remember last night and remember tomorrow night. Um, <laughs> um, it's actually not that complicated once you get into it. Okay. So to... Uh, it, but it will, for many of you, it will sound like, whoa, what, what's going on here? Okay. Well, just why don't you just do tomorrow night the, now? <laughs> ascertaining the pervasion, is that the same thing that ascertaining the object to be negated? No. no. Oh. Step one is ascertaining the object to be negated, which means um, being really feeling this sense of self and how it feels like it exists inherently and you know what you're aiming at. My aim is going to be in this exercise to disprove that, to refute it, to see through it. Okay, that's step one. Step two is really landing in a point of real conviction uh, and, the, and the conviction is necessary. We really feel absolutely if it inherently existed it would have to exist in one of these seven ways which I haven't yet gone through. Okay, and that's called ascertaining the pervasion. It might it means pervades. It must pervade all these possibilities. No other possibility. But the conviction is what's important. If we don't have the conviction, logically, <coughs> this practice won't work. It will it's not a waste of time, but almost a waste of time. Okay. Could, could ascertaining the pervasion, persuading yourself that there are only these yes. possibilities. Being being resting, being really. N really um, convinced in in yourself. Those are the only seven. The, those are the only seven. There's right. no there's no other real possibility. Convince possi yourself. Yes. Yeah. Reach a point of conviction. Yeah. It's a part of the warm up to this meditation. So this medit because it's new to a lot of people, it will take some reflecting on. If you're going to pick it up, reflecting on before you're kind of ready to bring it to the cushion. And then you use those seven to Exactly. And so the second one, once you've got the practice, is just reminding yourself of that conviction and feeling that conviction. Then you're ready to go into that. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Ready for the chariot. All right. So, um... So the third one is what? It's the third one, the actual okay. meditation at the end. The, 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 the relationship of the... <coughs> I, I, I think it's better if, if I, 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 I talk uh, yeah. rather than everyone talking. It, it, it's going to be a little tricky, so uh, just just hang in there. Could, could we ask you questions at the end? It might be better. I mean, it looks already like it's going to be a very long night, but it might be that um, it might be that I throw it out and you sit with it for a while. If you want, you might feel like I said you, you're not going to want to take this up. But if you do, you sit with it and you think through it and you see, and then and then come to me either in interviews or in a question answer on whenever it is in question. Yeah. It's just you said there were three steps, and I haven't yet heard the three steps. Because people keep it. <laughs> 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 so the third step is going through the seven possibilities and realizing that none of them can be can be are possible. So that's different to ascertaining the pervasion. Yes, ascertaining the pervasion is realizing that it it must be that uh, if the self exists inherently, it must be one of those. It must exist as yeah. one of those seven. Okay. And then the third step is actually going through the yeah. seven step, the seven possibilities. Um, before I get into the seven possibilities and actually pulling them apart and seeing why they need to they need to be that way, uh, I just want to fill out a little bit about how this works as a meditative process. So. Steps one, two, and then three. Um, what happens when we get to step three is we begin looking through these seven possibilities, one by one. You look through them and investigating and actually realizing that each one, the self, cannot be that way. It cannot be that way. And reaching the end and feeling like, 
there's no way, if the self inherently exists, that it can exist, because we've exhausted all the possibilities and they're all, they're all uh, wrong. At that point, if one, if one learns to take this up as a practice, at that point, something... something uh, well, it's actually quite remarkable happens. Um, the self, the sense of self, if that's what we're contemplating, because you can also do this on other objects, the sense of self begins to kind of disappear. And in its place, uh, a, a, a vacuity, an emptiness, takes its place. So we're actually looking at the sense of self, contemplating it, and going through this reason. If there's conviction, etc., it actually kind of vanishes. Okay, and in its place is a vacuity. Uh, if if one's when it's working, and like all practices, sometimes it works better than others. A vacuity appears, and then uh, one needs to focus, actually maintain the awareness on that vacuity, on that uh, non-finding, really. Uh, But it needs... The space that opens up there, the vacuity, needs to have the meaning of the emptiness of self. Okay, So sometimes meditative spaces can just become spaces with no meaning. There's just a kind of nothing, or it doesn't seem to mean anything. This space uh, is pregnant, you could say, uh, pervaded with an understanding of the non-inherent existence of the self. Okay, So it's actually, there's, it feels like there's nothing there, but that nothingness is actually full of meaning. It's full of meaning. Um, so it's not just a blank, it's not just that nothing exists, it's not a kind of, well, we can't really know how things exist. It's not a kind of um, state of open perplexity. Okay, so it's quite it's quite incisive in in its meaning, um, and I'm just f- filling out I'm doing this before I get into the um, the actual reasonings. At first, this sort of emptiness of the self feels like it's over there, and and the uh, the mind, so to speak, is looking at it over there, but. With a little bit of practice, even or, or more practice, it begins um, the sense of separation, the mind here and the emptiness there, begins to fade, and it's almost like they begin to melt into each other. The mind and the emptiness begin to kind of melt into each other and fuse, so to speak. Um, but still, that meaning, that pregnancy of meaning of emptiness, is there. It's not a blank. It's not a kind of unconsciousness. It's not a perplexity. It's not a non-knowing, okay? It's not a, a not a non an unknowing, uh, and the whole thing with this kind of melting gets less and less conceptual. Le- words, verbal formations, reasoning begins fading with this melting together. So we're using the logical faculty, the reasoning faculty, as a kind of avenue into the non-conceptual. And ultimately, they fade, they fuse completely together, and in the tradition they say, it's like water mixed with water. You can't tell the mind separate from emptiness. Emptiness and the mind completely fuse. That's that's the direction this is going in. <clears throat> so, I'm just outlining that for for the potential way it can unfold. Um, it's interesting, you know, and it's particularly interesting teaching Rishi like this, because, as you already get a sense, we can come at emptiness from so many different angles, and a lot of them will give very different meditative flavors to the experience. Or you could say, the terrain that we kind of traverse will be different depending on how we go about it. So this gives a particular flavor. Uh, Other practices, I'll introduce a very, very non-conceptual practice on Sunday, if you don't like this one. Um, And that, that kind of tends to unfold a different range of experiences. Ultimately, they all converge in this water mixed with water. But um, they, they, they actually have quite different flavors. Okay, so... Step number three, going through the actual reasonings. I, I was going to summarize them, I never really got that. So let's summarize them and then go through them individually. So Chandra Kirti says... A chariot is not findable as number one, number one of seven. 
one or some of its parts. Okay, and we could say... S-U-M or S-O-M-E? S-O-M-E, in this case. One or some of its parts. So we could say again, the self is not findable as one or some of the aggregates. Okay? Number two, so which, which S-O-M-E. Yeah. S-O-M-E. S-U-M comes later. Number two, is not other than its parts. So chari is not other, is not findable as something other than its parts. A self is not findable as something other than the aggregates. Okay? I'm going to go through these in, in much more detail. I'm just summarizing them right now. Would you be able to post these? Yeah, I will. Thank you. Already done it. Yeah. Number three. Uh, I'm going to translate number three as a chariot is not findable in its parts. In its parts. Okay? A self is not findable in the aggregates. And the parts are not in the chariot. The parts are not in something called... The ch- this is number four. Number four. The parts are not in the chariot. The aggregates are not in something called the self. can't find a self that the, that the aggregates are in. can't find a chariot that the parts of the chariot are in. <clears throat> number five... The chariot does not possess its parts. The chariot is not the possessor of its parts. Car is not the possessor of its parts. Uh, uh, self is not the possessor of the aggregates. Okay. Number six, it's not the mere collection of its parts. The chariot is not just a collection of parts. A self is not just a collection of aggregates. And number seven, uh, nor is the chariot the shape of the parts. So the self also is not the arrangement of the aggregates, either in space or time, and I'll I'll fill these out much more in detail. So say the self is not either the shape of the aggregates or the continuum of the aggregates. Continuum? Conti- it's n- e- neither the shape nor the continuum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, let's go through these one by one. First one said, uh, a chariot is not findable as one or some of its parts. A self is not findable as one or some of its aggregates. Um, when I look at the ag- when we look at the aggregates, or we look even at just the mind, let's say, I uh, begin to notice. Well, for instance, the mind has lots of mind states. It's many, uh, or rather, let's put it: the mind states are many, and the self as aggregates is already many. If we just say the self is the aggregates, already it's five. And we have a feeling of the self as one. Aggregates actually, the translation of kanda actually means heaps. So each aggregate is actually a heap. There's a heap of, of feelings we have. You know, pleasant, unpleasant, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. It's, a, it's like a pile. And they, they are many. And the sense of self we have is one. So... What does that imply? That there are many selves? Which mind state is me of this many? Either there are many selves, or all the aggregates are one. Okay. You, you're going to have to grapple with... with so, <laughs> either there are many selves, because I witness many mind states, or many, many feelings, many perceptions, etc. Uh, or all of that aggregates are, are one, are, are oneness, neither of which uh, fit. Certainly our sense of the aggregates is not that they are all one. In other and, words, that there isn't five or seven, that they're all one. Yeah, and that's not really, that's not our experience anyway. You know, even just one, take one aggregate, it's not our experience that it's just one. Um, 
Or we say, well, then there are many selves, but that's not the intuitive sense of self we have. We have a sense of self as one thing. Okay. But you can take this first reasoning and you can go a bit deeper. Uh, all of this, I'm going to throw out stuff and, uh, as I said, if you want to take this on, I'm actually going to talk in quite a lot of detail, but you, you will still have to kind of grapple with this internally to come to that second step of feeling like, yeah, actually, yes, that is true. And I can really say, yes, that's true. Uh, it takes it takes some thinking through and some grappling with. If is that a hand up or are you scratching your? Okay. <laughs> um, a, another possibility is actually looking at each of the aggregates and saying, "Is that me?" So it's not. Remember, it's not find what as one or some. Is that me? Is that me? Is that me? So, for instance, let's take the body first. Aggregate. Start with the body. Is the body me? Is that myself? Am I the body? If that were true, if it were true that the body is me, if I uh, had an amputation, or a person who is an amputee, uh, uh, would have less self. They would actually have less self. Or every time I cut my hair, or shave, or cut my fingernails, I would be losing some of myself. So I'd say maybe part of the body is myself. Which part? Westerners would usually go for the brain. So I can go through even parts of the body. Am I my liver? Is that me? Am I my, my, uh, this part, that part? So I can actually break the aggregate of the body down into sub-aggregates. Even with the brain, though, it's interesting. Uh, we tend to... We tend to... Um, to associate the self some, somewhere it's in the brain. But it's interesting, you know, if you know anyone with Alzheimer's and the people around them with Alzheimer's, but pe- parts of the brain actually die. And, and I have a sense, of, well, it's still them. It's still them. It's like the self, uh, wh- which part of the brain needs to die for the self to go? Actually, just look at parts of, of the body and get a sense, is that me? Uh, if we look carefully enough, we, we, it, it cannot be. It cannot be that the, the body is the self, or part of the body is the self. <laughs> um, if the body was a self, apart from anything else, the self would be unconscious, because the body is not conscious. It's the mind is something else. Um, we couldn't say, I am thinking, because the body doesn't do that. It's the mind that does that. If I say the mind is the self, then we couldn't say, for instance, I ache all over, or I kick the football, or he touched me, she touched me. This is tr- tricky stuff, but, but one, one needs to really dwell on it and, and think through it. And, and, uh, um, if I go through the aggregates, so again, so just body and mind, splitting a person into two, actually splitting it into five with the aggregates. Again, I could I could go even smaller. I could go into livers and cells and and whatnot, and I won't find a self there. The atoms in the cell, that atom, that atom, is that myself? Um, if I go to Vedana, and there's just this tone of things being pleasant or unpleasant or in between. Again, what do I see? I can't find anything that doesn't change there. Which Vedana am I? Which of it, all of them changes, and that's not the sense of self I have. I notice uh, changing, changing, changing. No, none of it lasts long enough to be called the self. And none of it is actually pretty personal. So my sense of, uh, my sense of pleasantness or unpleasant in any moment has nothing personal to it when I look at it. It's actually quite impersonal. It cannot be me. So... Looking at the aggregates, or even smaller, and actually just asking, is that me? Is that me? In the meditation, is that me? Is that me? Is that me? Actually, just that much, even without going through all seven, can actually bring quite a degree of, uh, well, I was going to say freedom, but actually can make quite an impact. Uh, Let's put it that way. So, doing this, one goes through the totality of what a human being could be, all the five aggregates, and, and be very clear, looking at each part and seeing every part should be clear uh, as not the self. So if you're doing a chariot or a car, every, every part of it is clear as not the chariot. 
So if we get into things like perception, similarly, they come, they go. How can that be me? They come and they disappear. And when they're not there, how could I be that? Because I still feel like me when I don't have a certain perception. The same with thoughts and moods and intentions. It leaves consciousness, which is a tricky one, and we're going to come back to consciousness a lot on this retreat and actually investigate it more. But in the teachings, consciousness actually means knowing. Knowing is a better translation of vijnana than consciousness. And so we know this, and we know that, and we know the next thing, and we know... And these knowings, again, they arise, and they disappear. How can it be the self? It's not personal or permanent enough. What's interesting in this is you, in order to do this at all, you've got, you've got to trust a sort of investigative process. Yes. And trust must be very closely linked to this idea of the self. So in a way, and I think you have no choice as a human being, but you actually are, in a way, I think, trusting something. You're trusting that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's even reasoning, it's something deeper than that, isn't it? Um, but it's interesting that you, there's something there. Yeah, you tr you, on, yes. I, I don't even know. If, I don't even know about process. Is this so contained in the other seven categories? Um, it is, because whatever process we experience as human beings must come under the aggregate. And eventually the, the capacity, the power of this analysis is actually to turn back on itself. We'll get to this later in the tree. You actually see that the process of analysis, the process of meditation, the process of consciousness is actually also empty. Um, so you're quite right, you are trusting things. One, one thing you're trusting is reasoning. The other thing you're trusting is the functionality of things. And... Uh, that um, and a certain amount of trusting conventional sort of knowledge that we get, um, but that's different than trusting the inherent existence of the self. It's quite subtle, but you're certainly it's based on trust, and it's trusting reasoning is one thing that it's trusting, um, which is a whole issue that I'm going to talk about tomorrow night. Trusting reasoning, because that's quite uh, that's quite a charged concept in 21st century Western countries. If I look at the, all, ev all the parts, look at aggregates, and I really look at them clearly, and I see it's not, it can't be that, it can't be that, it can't be that, it can't be that, and I really do this well and have a sense of doing it thoroughly, I will also feel like number six, the collection, I can't really accept that. I can't really accept that a bunch of stuff, none of which are the self, make a self somehow. So it will have, it will have a carryover effect for later on. Uh, one sees that if I just put things together that are not a self or a chariot and call it, call it that, that you can actually see it feels like something unreal that the mind is kind of gluing together in the mind. We'll, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> so we can do this with other people too. And let's say you're angry with someone. And say, who exactly am I angry with? Who am I angry with? Am I angry with their fingers? And actually, this is, so this is a really helpful meditative exercise. Am I angry at their fingers? Or am I judging their fingers? Am I angry at their, uh, I don't know, their uh, large intestine? Or their gallbladder? Am I angry at their Vedana? Am I angry at their perceptions? Am I angry at their knowing, their consciousness, their knowing, their knowing of this or that? Am I angry at that? Is, is it possible to be angry at that? Is it worth, does it make sense to be angry at that? Usually, when we're really going to say, I'm angry at their thoughts or their intentions and that, uh, or, or, or their moods. But again, if we go into this, those, and we've talked in other talks, those are dependent arisings. In other words, an intention comes, a person's intention for something is a momentary thing and it arises dependent on the context. It's not them. What we do is we solidify a self of the person that we're angry with, and that reinforces the anger. You guys okay? Yeah? Um, about the, well, the anger needs a target. The anger, <coughs> anger needs a target, needs a yes. Target. Anger needs a base or a target, exactly. And when we start seeing, actually, it doesn't have a target, uh, per se, it starts draining the anger or the judgmentalism or whatever else it is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's number one. That's number one of the seven. Number two. Uh, a chariot is not findable other than its parts. A self is not findable separate from or different than the aggregates. If it were, if we could find a self that's somehow separate from these five aggregates, 
we would actually, uh, if we mentally in meditation kind of shunt aside the five aggregates, let's just put them to one side, what's left? Is there anything left? Is there anything left, certainly, that I could call a self? Actually, I shunt aside mentally in my imagination all the aggregates, nothing's left. There's nothing left. So if it did exist as something separate, it would have to be apprehendable when I put, put aside the aggregates, but it's completely not. It's not found there. Uh, sometimes it feels like the self has its own kind of basis almost outside the aggregates, but that's when we look for it, we cannot find it outside the aggregates. Okay. Um, we could never apprehend it as such. We can only perceive or see or know something that is in the realm of the aggregates. So also, if it existed separately, it would be that this self that's somehow separate from the separate from consciousness and perception and feeling and form, it would actually be a complete and utter blank or non-existent thing. It, it wouldn't know anything. It would be completely pointless. Its existence would be completely pointless, completely useless. It wouldn't be able to do anything, and it wouldn't be able to know anything. Hmm. The this. Because if I'm thinking that this is number two is the mm -hmm. supposition of the Yoga Sutras of so many of the, the yogic texts of yeah. Patanjali and onwards. Yes. And I'm really struck by the, the chariot, the use of the chariot, because mm -hmm. obviously that's in the Mahabharata and so many other mm -hmm. where you've got the the, the Jiva, the Atman, whatever whatever particular text they're trying to to, um, to prove the existence of, um, you've got the the driver. Uh -huh. And then the chariot, yeah. which is the senses. Yeah. Um, so, yogis would say that there's not a blank and non-existent mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. They would say it's part of this divine universal consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good. Do we have a? We're going to revisit this divine universal consciousness in a very big way uh, in, during this retreat. Um, uh, the, the the Buddha's. You know, teaching is any consciousness cannot be the, the self. Any consciousness, so it's a, whether it's subtle or expanded or whatever, they're all actually, um, m experientially, they're all consciousnesses that we experience and then don't experience, and experience and don't experience. Um, if uh, Even if I say there's one big divine consciousness, then I still have to look at that and say, well, is that one thing, really? Because either it doesn't know anything, in which case it's not really a consciousness, or it knows lots of things, and then when it knows this, it's not the consciousness that's knowing that. It's a different... In other words, we postulate an entity where there's actually, uh, uh, you could say, separate things. Difficult? It's a lot more complicated than that. It is a lot more... Because, yeah. you know, if you... I mean, they... <laughs> The Bhagavad Gita talks about the jiva being like a little separate seed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. off the global mm -hmm. Brahman, and and so I think for us just to say, well, that's blank. It's like if okay. we're doing a, a logic process, okay. we have to be able to sure. say, sure, sure. But then you would have to ask, what are the properties of that, and and it, does it have properties that are outside the aggregates? So we could say, bearing in mind that the consciousness aggregate is 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 knowing and perceiving of of the six senses, you know, the mind and other things, and we're saying it cannot be that, okay. So if there's something outside of that, it would have to not know anything because it wouldn't be conscious. Why would it have to know anything? Why, what, my question is, why would it why would it have to be blank? Um, because it doesn't have the properties of consciousness or perception or feeling or anything like that. Couldn't we tap into it through our aggregates? Um, then it's still... You, you will find that whatever you, we experience through the aggregates is actually part of the aggregates, because perception, and then we would have to perceive this. And then, so that perception is then part of, our, is part of the aggregates, right? There's nothing I can know that's outside of the aggregate. Aggregates are the sum total of my experience. So there's, there's nothing knowable outside of the aggregates. So, and that's the whole, you have to perceive of something. 
we I think. You always have, perception involves perceiving of something. Okay. Yeah. So you can't have perception and an object. Okay. Uh, uh, perception, by definition, if you if you inquire, what does it mean to perceive? It involves something that's perceived. Uh, I'll, I'll go into this more a little bit in this talk and and uh, later on as well. And that's where the dependent origination comes in, isn't it? Because that's the whole connection between mm -hmm. the seer and yeah. so you have to believe in that for this supposition to be. Yes, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if believers are right, but you have to see that that's how it works. I would say. Yeah, we um, don't always remind yourself of it when because me you just hearing it would be blank. Yes, I, I yes. Think. So all of this you have to you have to really work through to get this conviction of and actually mm -hmm. say yes that would have to be like that you know um, what they say in Buddhist teachings is more like such a self uh, as you're talking about this rider of the chair is actually is not even the innate sense of self because if I say um, if I say that it's the the self exists separately from the aggregates, then what you have is something quite different from the way we usually feel about life. You have a sense of what happens to the aggregates, or, or a logical conclusion, that what happens to the aggregates actually has nothing to do with the self. And the self that we actually care about innately, you know, if you, you have a gun to someone's head, the self that they care about is the aggregate. It's somehow wrapped up with the aggregates. Um, so they, what they say in Dharma teachings is this, this is... Uh, a philosophical view of self. It's not even an innate view. It's, a, it's one that's kind of offered as, as a philosophy. There are certain meditation experiences that we can go into that would seem to suggest something like that. But, uh, and they're really, really significant and important on, as stepping stones to freedom. But they're still bound up with the aggregates, and it's, it's important to see that. Any meditation experience I have is bound up with the aggregates. Um, we'll revisit that right at the end. But... Um, so the self that we care about, the self that I am attached to and that I look out for and I try and defend and pump up and beat up and, and all that, is, is actually wrapped up with the aggregates. And if I say it's something separate, then the fate of the aggregates has nothing to do with the self. And that's not the, the sense we have of things. Um, I'm, I'm really quite concerned about time, so I, do, I think it's... A differentiation, a differentiation yeah. yes, to be made between just uh, our self as we are here in this room, let's say, and the enlightened self, the, the Buddha's self. B Buddha's lack inherent existence. Buddha's, the Buddha's would be the first to say that they lack inherent existence. Absolutely. And if they say they don't, they're not a Buddha. Mm -hmm. Uh, really, really important, yes. So uh, we can talk about the appearance of this or that self, the manifestation of this or that quality of the etc., but uh, always lacking inherent existence. But would they not know themselves to be a lot more than the five candles I the universe? Um, no, the, bu the Buddhas would... I couldn't hear your question. Uh, Richard... Would, would the Buddhas not know themselves to be much more than the five candles, even though they, it hasn't got inherent existence? So we will be revisiting... Could everyone hear that? No. Uh, so Richard's asking, would a Buddha not know themselves as much more than the five aggregates as actually the entire universe? And, and again, the answer is no. So as a meditative um, experience, we can feel a sense of oneness, cosmic oneness. But the, the Buddha's very, very clear about that. I think extremely important meditative experience, you know, to be cultivated, to be nurtured, to be enjoyed, to be, you know, let uh, affect the heart, etc., open up love, etc., but to be gone beyond. And so, but categorically, a Buddha would say uh, the view of oneness and oneness with the cosmos is not is not uh, is not the right view of self. Okay, so any view of self is as anything inherently existent is not is not right. Because it comes in it goes. Um, it well, I, I, you, you, you can say as an experience it comes and goes, yeah. but actually, more accurately, and we'll get into this much more as the retreat goes on. It's a, it's still a fabricated perception. So as the as retreat goes on, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, how our perceptions, whether they're everyday or deep meditative perceptions, are actually fabricated. They're fabricated by delusion, by grasping, by identification, all kinds of ways. When I have, a, when the consciousness opens up in a sense of oneness, uh, it can feel like, wow, this is this is the real McCoy. Um, but actually, it's still a fabricated perception. It takes a lot to see that. 
to me, that's a much deeper reason for undermining that as the self than uh, just that it's impermanent. Because if it's impermanent, one could say, well, I'm dropping into a sense of ultimate reality, and then I'm dropping out of it, and all I need to do is kind of hang out there more, but I've glimpsed it. Mm-hmm. Versus actually understanding, no, I see, I'm very clear how this was built. It, it, was, it was a fabricated perception of oneness. We have a fabricated perception of separateness. We have a fabricated perception of, of whatever. But this I'm going to be explaining much, much more as the retreat goes on. Uh, to me, that's very, very significant in understanding the fullness of what emptiness means, the fabrication of perception. Okay, so if, if we had this split, it would mean that the, the journey, the, the fate of the aggregates, the manifestation of the aggregates, w- would all be irrelevant to the fate of the self. And that's not how we feel, intuitively, innately. Uh, what happens to my body, mind, what happens in the realm of the senses and uh, memories, etc., it's all independent somehow of what happens to me. And that's not the way we feel. That's not the innate sense of self. We can postulate other philosophical selves, and there is ways of kind of refuting them too, but just talking about the innate sense of self. Okay, number three. Uh, Diff- get different wordings of this if, if you end up reading different texts. Uh, you say, inherently, the self is not inherently dependent on the aggregates, or the self uh, is not the base of the aggregates. I'm going to translate it as in. The self is not in the aggregates. In other words, we, we look in the aggregates, and you can't actually find a self. But, uh, well, let's take three and four together. The self, three is the self as in the aggregates, and four, as the aggregates in the self. Um, Both of these, so number three is like, uh, if the self is in the aggregates, it's like a person in a house. Okay? It's like the self is somehow in this, I don't know, thing, these uh, unfoldings called the aggregates, and the self is somehow in there as something separate. In other words, we could knock down the house, and the person's just standing there with all the house falling around. Similar to uh, the second reasoning, we could shunt aside all the aggregates, and the self would be there. So it's it's a variation on the second. Do, do you see that? Do you mean physically? Like the sense that we physically feel it inside our ribcage? That's part of our innate sense of self, that we actually, that's part of... In the house. Yes, but the house also being the, the mind, because we sometimes feel it in the mind, so yeah. as, as some, somehow in the mind, yeah. Um, number four is the flip of that. So there's a self, and somehow this self kind of holds or contains the aggregates. Somehow the aggregates are in the self. And this is like, um, this is like uh, when you have breakfast uh, here, and I don't know what you guys have, muesli or hazelnut crunch or whatever it is, and you put your stuff in the bowl, and somehow the self is that bowl, and the aggregates are the raisins and the nuts and the oats and the milk, and the, those are the aggregates. And again, I could pour that out, even just in my mind, I pour that out, and I'm left with the bowl. I take the house down, I'm left with the person. But we've seen from number two, when I do that, I can't find anything that makes any sense. So in a way, they're subtler variations of number two, they're instances of number two of the self being separate from the aggregates. Do you mean in that sense that, it sounds ridiculous, but you, you can't find breakfast. You can find milk and hazelnut crunch, but you can't find breakfast. <sighs> like, just like Gilbert Ryle, when you look for Oxford University, you could find buildings and books. But All, all, this, is, all, all this is an example of that. Uh-huh. All this whole thing is an example of that. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Number five. <clears throat> the self does not possess the aggregates, the chariot is not the possessor of its parts. This actually also, actually in English, we have two ways that we kind of mean possess. So sometimes I say, this tree possesses a trunk. But that would be an instance of number one, because where is the tree separate from the trunk? The tree is, you know, the tree is the trunk kind of thing. It's part of the tree's being. So that would be an instance of number one, of equating parts with with the thing. Okay. More often, we talk about possession as like, I possess, uh, I possess something like my mobile phone. It's actually not mine; it belongs to Guy House. But um, I possess my genes. Uh, and if there's possession, it's an instance of some again something that's separatable. So ownership, ownership possession. Yes. 
the self does not own the, the aggregate. So, like a mobile phone, I can lose it, I can put it somewhere, and myself can be somewhere else. Uh, like my genes, I can put them somewhere, and myself is somewhere else. But I, so it's an instance of number two. You understand? Of being able to clear away the aggregates and somehow find a self. Um, how are you guys doing? Because I, I could go into... You can't leave us at this point. I'm not going to leave you at this <laughs> point. I'm just want, there's a degrees of detail that we can go into this. And uh, I'd like you to give us the gestalt and then you know, see the whole thing. And then well, you, you're definitely going to get the whole thing. It's just a matter of how... From time to time, maybe we could have a break. Yeah. It, it would just one second. Um, how do you feel about having a break? I'm fine with that. No? Well, some people don't want to, and some people do. I've never done that in a talk before. Um, well, it's occurred to me. Um, all right. Let, let's let's just push through. It's look. I I know it's very. Let's just see if we can uh, finish it. Okay. So I'm going to leave out a chunk. Um, it's fine. It doesn't alter the gestalt at all. Um, Yeah, P- so possession, if I possess something, like I possess my mobile phone or my genes, it means that I can um, put that thing somewhere. I, I own that thing. I can put it somewhere, and I can be, the self can be somewhere else. That's usually what we mean. E- possession is either a possession of sameness, mm-hmm. of being. In other words, like the tree that possesses its trunk. Yeah. So it's, it's actually an instance of number one. It's a part. Mm-hmm. Or possession is different. And it means that, um, like my mobile phone or my genes, I can put it somewhere and the self can be somewhere else. In which case, possession as something different becomes an instance of number two. And I can't find this something that owns the aggregates outside of the aggregates when I clear them away. Why does this come as a separate point? When it uh, because, yeah, for, as I said um, at the beginning, uh, either the self is somehow the same as or among the aggregates or di- or different and people are like mm. so what what we're doing with this sevenfold is is filling out kind of ways that the mind will hide s- a sense of inherent existence and actually fleshing them out a bit more and sometimes it feels like the self is the possessor of, of the aggregates so uh, just going into that in a bit more it, it helps the power of the whole thing meditatively yeah does that make sense Ollie? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Like you possess that notebook, right? We say you, it's Ollie's notebook. I, I guess what I, I guess what I don't quite get is why you'd ever think of yourself as the possession of something. Is the possessor of something? Is that what you said? No, I mean it's is not the possession of its parts. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the self is not why the. Would you ever, po- I don't understand that, why that would be in the list. Of course, it wouldn't. Be. The self is the possessor, not the, po- the self is not the possessor of its parts because that's how we feel. This this is my my whatever my right. my my thoughts my this my that my arm my etc. Right? Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Okay, possessor. Um, wondering what's okay to leave out here. I'll try to do that a bit later. Um, okay, number six, uh, the collection as, as a possibility, the collection. If we go to a chariot, for instance, translate back to a chariot, I have parts, I have wheels, I have a... Uh, do chariots have a steering wheel? Or whatever. Um, <laughs> a- a- axles, um, air conditioning. <laughs> um, uh, I dump all those together as a collection. It's not the thing. Right? I just dump this collection is not the thing. It cannot be the thing. Um, same if I take my body as a thing. I'm examining the inherent existence of my body. I just dump the parts together, arms and hairs and eyes and whatnot. It's not the body. Okay. Uh, similarly with the aggregates, if I somehow just, if it were even possible, to get a collection of aggregates and just dump them in a pile somehow, okay, that's not the self. That's not the, that cannot be the self. Number seven. Uh, the shape 
Okay, the chariot is not the shape of its parts. There's many reasons to this, but um, one thing that really, again, gives gives a sense of why it couldn't be is, um, <clears throat> well, let's take let's take a body, let's take a body, and rather than a chariot or a self, a body. And does this body is this body the shape of its parts? So if you imagine looking at this body, my body right now, you say, okay, imagine that very slowly my ears started moving downwards and uh, down uh, and finding their way towards my feet. That's what happens as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> and my toes started moving upwards and my eyes found their ways in different directions in the body and etc., etc. Slowly, the, ch- the shape changed. At what point, again, this goes similar, at what point do you say, now, hold on, <laughs> something ain't right there, it's not quite a body there. Okay. Just define it differently, that's all. Well, yeah, the mind imputes it. The mind imputes it. Okay, but is it, it doesn't quite disprove it, it gives a sense of that. Okay, it gives a sense of how this is something the mind gives it. Um, when you actually go into this, I don't know whether I should, but when you actually go into shape, actually you see a shape, let's take the shape of my hand, that shape is actually many shapes. It's the shape of the fingers and the thumb and the palm and the lines and the... All, all that is actually... How many shapes is this one shape of a hand? It's actually an infinite amount of shapes. You have to go right down to those... Do they all have to be there for it to be the shape of the hand or can some be different? You get the, you get the sense. It's like shape is actually, again, the mind gives something. My mind gives it that. Anyhow, in terms of the self and the aggregates, it's not shape that's an issue. It's it's shape in time, which is what we could call a continuum. It's not the spatial shape. If we talk about the mind, the mind doesn't have a spatial shape. The mental aggregates can't, can't give them a spatial shape. Um, we talk about the arrangement in time, the continuum. And some even Buddhist uh, commentaries will say the self is the continuum of the aggregates in time. That's what the self is. Um, but there are problems here. There are problems here. This is the last one, and it's in a way the most subtle one in some ways. Problems. What, what's the problem? The past is gone of a continuum in time. So let's say even just a continuum of consciousness, of moments of consciousness. The past is gone. Where is it? It's gone. The future has not come. If I am the uh, continuum, then I can't, because the past is gone and the future is gone, I can't even make something called a continuum as a kind of composite. I can't make a mass of something that's gone and not yet, not yet there. If that's the self, this continuum, most of it actually doesn't even exist right now. Because in the present moment, where is it? Most of that... Uh, we, we have a sense of self, like, my self is fully here right now. When we feel into the innate sense of self, it's like the self is here. It feels like it's all here. It's not like it's not all here right now. But if it was a continuum, most of it, we could say 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
if we just, uh, not really a sidetrack, but like a side thought that someone might have is say, well, if you talk about Rob, for instance, and say, so, all right, but in this moment, it may not be that Rob is exhibiting his defino- defining characteristics somehow. In this moment, you might be a continuum, but in this moment, you maybe you're just sitting meditating or whatever. You're not defining your uh, characteristics right now, right now. But the self is still there because it has the potential to do that. We might feel something like that. Um, and that potential is, is kind of a property of the continuum somehow, which is fair enough. However, and we talked in the past, what I exhibit, the, the traits, the characteristics, the actions that I exhibit are also dependent. They are dependent arising, dependent on the situation, the environment, uh, the past and all that. None of that exists either in an independent way. <clears throat> Not proofs, but a few things to think about. If it was the continuum in time, the self was the continuum of moments of consciousness in time, and that was the true nature of the self, would it then be that I would have to have experiences in a certain order to still feel like I was the self? So the continuum is an arrangement in time. It's not a proof, but it, it begins to suggest something. Would I still be me if I had two kind of very insignificant experiences in the reverse order? What, what do you mean? Like, if, if time was... Different? No, if I'm saying, like, we, I feel... All right, I feel... Um, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I, make, uh, I make this sound, uh, and I make this sound... Brrr. And if it was a continuum, my, myself would actually be dependent on the ordering that that happened in. But that's not the sense. I, say, I feel the same whether one happens first or the other happens first. It's not a proof. It's just something that's suggesting of... of uh, it can't quite be. A continuum like is, is actually a manyness. It's a manifoldness. It's not... We, we, cause it's a continuum, like it's one thing. Again, we have a sense of the self as one thing. It's actually, it's actually many things. A, con- a continuum is necessarily a collection of many. And that, than linear? Uh, no, well, a linear collection of many. In other words, that's a, what continuum is. It's a collection of many things. Many instances, many moments, you could say. Yeah. Um, oh, I see what you're trying to say. As an unbroken lin- linearity. Li- mean. Linear in time. Linear in time. Continuum is linear in time, but I think April's asking, is, is it unbroken like that? Um... Well, the fact is that we do chunk it in terms of experiences, and, and, and so it is actually divisible that way. And then it becomes a manyness, and the self, again, we feel as a oneness, not as a manyness. Um, let's, let's push on and, and, and finish. So, um, I'm afraid if you ask, John is, John is uh, very specifically stressing that it's, he's, Buddhism is not saying that the self doesn't exist, mm-hmm, it does exist mm-hmm. but that it's a process. Yeah. Yeah, I would also say uh, maybe a slight difference there. Um, I would say the self doesn't exist inherently as a process either, because I come to this right at the end. It's like sometimes we think, okay, the self's a process, but that process really exists, or the elements that make up that process really exist, and that's part of a subtle place that the uh, delusion will hide a sense of self. But it's very subtle. It's much more subtle than the, the... But to me, that's not quite full enough yet. We have to actually see that the process doesn't inherently exist and the elements that make up the process don't inherently exist. I will touch this at so the end. Reduced it down, unlike him, you'd stick your neck out to say specifically the self. There is no self. No, I would say there's no inherently existing self. I would say <laughs> the self is a dependent arising and exists conventionally, is able to function, but, it's, but it has no inherent existence. So in the first thought, it's, it's quite a thing to understand what that means that it can appear and be here and function, and we can feel it, um, but it doesn't inherently exist. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's a journey of understanding, this whole emptiness business, and, and so we swing uh, by going too far into kind of nihilism, it doesn't exist, or, or not enough, actually, not quite enough, and actually just refuting it a little bit, and it's not quite full enough to bring the full freedom. So the journey is, to me, it's kind of, there's kind of a swing involved between those two. I don't think that's exactly John's view, though. Okay, good. So I, 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 I couldn't say that. Yeah. I, I, think, I don't think he'd say what Ollie was suggesting, good. but good. he might 
Yeah. He's saying no, no thingness. Okay, good. Yeah. So, in other words, this uh, a thing, a process, is is not findable as uh, as an inherent existence, and neither the elements that make up the process. And that, that's quite important. Like going to, we'll talk a lot as the retreat goes on, uh, getting to that degree of, of thoroughness of, of unfindability. Yeah, good. And when you say about, like, sorry, just as really quick, like having to get a balance between nihilism yeah, and nihilism, yeah. isn't it actually that, that when you're awakened, you see both? It's uh, not like you're finding a pinpoint on that spectrum, it's that you can actually behold. The, the existence that we, that most of us see, mm-hmm. and then the non-existence. Yes, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that. Um, uh, so let's just say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but reaching that place, um, one will swing. One will swing. Most most people will swing. Mm. You know. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So. Last piece here about this, uh, for filling the seventh out. If the self is the continuum of the aggregates, remember we said the aggregate is actually the totality of experience. So it then means that the self is not independent of experience. It's not independent from the totality of experience. Uh, it's not uh, separate from experience. Um, so when, per- when we perceive uh, perception as an experience, but involves the world, it involves the uh, the out there, and um, if I say it's a continuum of the aggregates, the aggregates actually involve uh, this kind of what we could call an interface with with the world. Um, if we go really deep deeply, well, now the felt sense of I is that it does exist independently, and it doesn't matter what experiences I have. Maybe we pick out a few significant experiences in our life and say that was really significant in building, and that was, but actually it would have to involve all of them, all the most insignificant details. But even more deeply, the present moment of knowing anything, of any experience, um, how to say this, the, the, the consciousness is not separate from what is known. You, you understand? So every time we know, there's like two sides of a coin here. There is the knowing and the, and, and, and the, the subject, we could call consciousness, and the what is known, and they go together. So it means that if the self is, is the continuum of aggregates, it's actually not findable as something separate from any experience or any, anything else in the totality. Do, do you understand? It's not, uh, with the, the sense we have is of something separate and of something that's independent of all that. Anytime there's knowing, there's a known. Is it possible to, uh, going back to what April asked before, is it possible, I think it was April, um, that we have uh, a perceiver? Uh, is it possible we have perception without perceiving or a perceiver in that moment? Is it possible I can find any of these separately? Are they the same? So they're not the same. The perceiver is not the perceived. But they're also not separate. I cannot find them separate. Uh, there's an unfindability here, an unseparability here. There's nothing actually separate. The mind and the world are not separate. The past and the future are not separate. Does that make sense if I say that? That that kind of two sides... Implicit in the aggregates is this actually kind of non-separateness of of the self and the world. And if I'm saying it's the continuum, I'm actually assenting to a kind of non-separateness and that's not the innate sense of self that we have. We have a sense of a self that's somehow independent. This could happen to me, or that could happen to me. When we begin to say, I can't actually find the dividing line between this self and, and the world, the totality of the universe. Okay. Th- those are the seven. And, and like I said, uh, quite a project... Um, but what will make it, if you decide to take it on, either on this retreat or in the future, you, you're going to have to think through them for yourself and kind of really grapple a little bit and, and reach a point of, and even find your own reasonings why it doesn't work out. Uh, 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 that's fine to do. So, I, I, I'm sorry, I mean, maybe this 
What's the point? The, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, why? No. Of course. Why? Why? Because, going back to the first talk, why do we suffer? We suffer because we be- the, the thesis of all this, all this whole retreat, is we suffer because we feel that the self has an in- inherent existence and things, too, have an inherent existence. And we need to see that that is delusion, that that's not true, that cannot possibly be true. When we do, and we are able to really see that and feel the impact of that, it frees us. That's the point. But we're starting with an... It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a tautological thing. We're starting with it's not going to... We'll go through these steps to prove what we began knowing, which is that there is no self. Oh, okay, but like I said at the beginning... I, I don't know if I'm saying... Oh, my okay, well, let me, let me say something. See, like I said right at the beginning, I think I began this talk with, it's easy to say there is no self. Anyone can say that. Anyone can say that. It's easy to say the self ultimately is an illusion. Therefore, let go. The, the real juice of the whole thing, the real you know, marrow of the whole thing is, can I know that here in a way that frees me? And so how do I move from this statement, which some people would believe, some people would turn their noses up, some people would argue with, that the self is an illusion. How do I move from that as a statement, as an intellectual statement, to actually a heartfelt truth? Uh, that's the journey, and, and this is one way one way of filling that journey. Without that journey, the whole thing is just like, well, what would be the point of that? What would be the point of just saying that the self is an illusion and not, not actually really digesting that deeply at a cellular level? Um, that would be kind of pointless. So this is, as I said, take it or leave it uh, for all of you, but um, this is one way that can go very deep, actually really, really letting that understanding penetrate deeply. So the way this is working is, going back, if... Uh, the unfindability in any of these ways implies the lack of inherent existence. Okay? It doesn't imply that the self doesn't exist, it implies that it doesn't exist inherently. Uh, so that, that, that's a key. key very key. Very key. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's inherent that it has inherent existence, that that's the illusion. That's the illusion, yeah. Yeah. But, Yeah, I'm going to. This is diffi- This is the thing that's really difficult to understand. It's like, what exactly are we refuting when we say inherent existence? It's this sense that something exists somehow independently, from its own side, uh, independent of the way of looking at it, etc. That's actually quite subtle to see that that's what's being refuted here, um, and it's a, it's really a journey to understand that deeply. I, I feel um, that's why the last talk I will be I will be talking exactly about that balance. Um, to say something we've already said. Sometimes a person says, okay, uh, I'm, you're basically saying the self doesn't exist at all, that, that nothing exists at all. And that's not what's being said. That would be going over into nihilism. But a common mistake is to say, it's okay, all we're refuting is the inherent existence of things, therefore just carry on as you are. And, uh, and we're, back with the, we're back in the normal default. That's the danger of... Uh, so this is, it's, I call it a razor's edge. It's such a fine line of subtlety, of, of kind of penetrating understanding. We will fall both ways. We'll also, as I said later in the talk, we will find a tendency to fall one way or another. Um, but we can have too much caution with this. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this later. Um, so can I just say, inherent existence as in independent and separate... Independent, separate, existing by itself. Well, yeah, you could say that, but careful that emptiness doesn't end up just sounding like oneness. Okay? So if I say not separate, there's a way that we can just... So oneness is great, uh, very important, but it's, it's a kind of, at best, a stepping stone onto an understanding of emptiness. So, yes, it's true, I don't exist separately from the rest of the universe. Um, but... Uh, there, there's more to it than that. There's mm-hmm. particularly, on, and this goes back to the first talk, and again, I'm, it's like, I keep wishing I could say everything at once and keep reminding you of this impossible. So to me, what it means to say empty is realize that the mind is actually doing something when it perceives anything, self or anything, and it has a way of uh, 
creating a kind of experience as if things existed by themselves, in themselves, of themselves, uh, o- over there somehow, independently of the way that the mind is looking at or conceiving of them or perceiving them. So that's the fuller meaning of what emptiness means. Can I just... F- is it okay if I finish? Yeah. But, um, so... If uh, sometimes a person says, "Well, it could be all of the seven, but all of the seven implies uh, that inherently it's not this or that." And again, when does it shift between the seven? Dependent on the way the mind is looking, which is another way of saying it's not this or that in itself. It's dependent on the mind. It's empty. So. Um, as I said when I was outlining the sort of meditative procedure first you have to actually think through all this stuff and it has to you know, sit with you good, and then you feel like it's portable and you're able to take it into the meditation and actually use it meditatively <clears throat> and then this vacuity will open up if you're doing it, if it's going well and you, and you kind of focus on that you, you stay steady on that with its meaning the meaning of this unfindability as meaning the lack of inherent existence if you get into this practice, whether it's on this retreat or, or later in your life, whatever, what tends to happen is that at a certain point, um, uh, obviously, you can come out of the meditation. It's almost like you can let the vacuity disappear and the sense of self reappear. And re- it reappears with a sense of inherent existence. And then it's almost like uh, it reappears, but it's qualified by your understanding, by your seeing that it's empty. And it's almost like, ooh. That's interesting. It, it looks like it's inherent existence. It feels like it's inherent existence. But I'm actually, I'm actually really knowing and holding that knowledge that it appears as inherent existence, and I know it's not. And that's a very important uh, stage too. When you're in the in the meditation on this, and it's again, if it goes quite deep, and there's that that sort of vacuity, um, we have to keep remembering this meaning. Keep remembering the meaning of emptiness. Uh, it takes, uh, you know, I can't rush through this. In time, you actually can uh, go quite quick, really quite quickly through this because you've absorbed it. But we have to take our time and really make it work. Um, when you're in the meditation, the mind wobbles or loses that sense of feeling like it's uh, lacking inherent existence. You can bring in a bit of reasoning and just kind of, it's like stoking a fire. You're just turning over the embers and you, you get that sen- that conviction again. So we're not, in this kind of practice, again, this is a subtle point, but we're not actually looking for something called emptiness. We're looking for the inherent existence of something and then realizing that we can't find it. And that's, uh, we're feeling that inherent existence, step number one, and then feeling the emptiness of it, really letting that impact on the being. So this is a picture of one kind of analysis, and they talk about balancing this analysis with samadhi. So getting the mind calm and then doing the analysis, and the mind calm and the analysis. <clears throat> At a certain point, when this gets really humming, the actual analysis itself starts to drop the whole being into quite a, quite a deep state of samadhi, uh, because, like we talked about, insight leads to samadhi some, sometimes, and then uh, that that's quite uh, you know to, to benefit from that, you don't need to keep going back to the samadhi. Uh, at a certain point, they fuse. Okay. They fuse. In other words, the very meditation on that emptiness starts to bring the same kind of joy and uh, mm-hmm. that you would get in samadhi, and the mind kind of really locks in on it as well. Yeah. So they become one, actually. Okay. They talk about, in the Galug tradition that you're from, they talk about the union of... Um, what, what's the... The union of... Uh, I've forgotten what the phrase is, but, but it, uh, it's special insight is that coming together. Okay. Basically. Um, 
Right. Yeah. yeah, I would have it first, get it really clear, and then hold it sometimes, but you'll find that it can still carry over the meaning of what you're doing, even when you're not... So it's on not, tap, isn't it? It's on tap, exactly, and you can just refresh yourself of it at times, yeah. yeah. But uh, you'll find actually you can sometimes do it, letting go of that sometimes. Probably in strict textbooks you'll, they'll say no, but actually you can get away with it. Um, now, this we can do to anything, not just cells, but absolutely anything. Any, any object, any phenomenon, any situation, it's the same thing. Uh, will not be findable as any of these seven options. Same, same possibility. Um, if, and again, I'm just filling this out for the future, if, if at some point in your life you, take, you really take this particular avenue up, um, what you find is if you really go deeply into the self, of, into the emptiness of the self, really deeply, it actually has, preg in that pregnancy of meaning, it actually has the emptiness of all things. All things. And it's like to see the emptiness of one thing is to see the emptiness of all things deeply. Um, but it's also something as a practice we can do to this and that, and uh, practice it on the self, practice it on another, practice it on uh, a retreat, you know, this or that thing that feels like it has inherent existence. Um... So, as I said, uh, and, and Ollie was wondering whether, what John meant when he, when he said, and, uh, it's not that we're arriving at a view of the self as some kind of mechanism. It's not like we're, we want to get to some place where we're viewing the self as actually truly some kind of mechanistic process and we're reducing it to its elements and that's the true self. We're actually going beyond that too. And if I go deeply enough into emptiness, I see that those elements and that process too is empty. As I said right at the beginning, this is the final thing, um, you, you can shelve it, you can ignore it, you can save it for later, you could take it up now, as you like. Uh, I, I'm not really bothered. Um, but there is a way in time that all these practices and angles that we'll be going through and approaches that we'll be going through on this retreat tend to fill each other out. They're like a jigsaw and they give life to each other and more sort of power and profundity to each other. Um, they yeah reinforce each other and fill out each other's meaning. You just start with one bit of it. Yes, in fact, last year was quite uh, interesting for me uh, teaching this because I last year was the first time I'd ever taught I'd ever taught this to anyone. Um, and uh, people were getting quite a lot out of just doing the first one, just kind of looking at, at aggregates, saying, is that me, is that me? So that will open up already quite a bit of, ooh, you know. Um, so by all means, yeah. But um, it's weird, you know, I, I know it sounds complicated, it sounds like a lot. It, it might be actually less than, than you think to do the whole thing, but by all means just start with, like, the first one. Uh, first stage. The, the first of the well, the first stage certainly, but the first of the reasonings as well, and just and just kind of look: is that me? 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 And and see what that does. And is stage two formally meditative? Or, um, I if I'm doing it, I always check in that that conviction is there. Uh, if I'm doing it as a meditator, just really check that that conviction is there, because as I talk tomorrow night, we. Um, Sorry, the conviction that we have an innate self. The, the, no, the, convi the conviction that if we had an inher inherent existence self, it would have to exist in one of these ways. So that's a kind of, it's, it's throwing your lot in, throwing your dice in with the logical process. Now there's a whole lot about that that we, or many here in this room, would feel like, well, I don't know about that. And even if we're all for logic, we still feel a little hesitant at that point. It's like, it's a, it's a big commitment. It feels like, well, I believe, all right, but I still, it still feels a lot to say. So it's, it's good to check in meditatively with Does that. Does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy? If what? You, if you throw your lot, your mm -hmm. dice in, and mm -hmm. say, I'm believing that to begin with, mm -hmm. then everything that follows becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if you're saying, I believed it to begin with, mm -hmm. I go through these steps, yeah. I'm going to come out believing it because I said I believed it to begin with. <laughs> well, you've invested a certain amount. I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, you, you, what are you? What are you coming out believing? That there is. 
that, that the self is, that there's no inherent existence. But that's not what you start believing. That's not, when, when Ryan asks, what's, the, what's step number two, what's the conviction there? It's not that there isn't an inherent existing self. It's that if there was, it would have to exist in one of these ways. It's qualified. Isn't it? it's, that, it's qualified. The conviction is you're qualifying it by saying that if there was an innate sense of self, it would be found in... in one of those it, 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 would, it would have to be. It exhausts all the possibilities. That's essential kind of... The, yeah. Yes. So all this, you know, I'm aware. We've just gone through. I've just been trying to be as logical as possible, as clear as possible. So it feels like, pff, I mean, for some of you, we're just thinking, get me out of here. You know, this is this is a nightmare of kind of uh, log. But actually, we're talking about really, str- you know, this is a very powerful meditation. I, I have to say, um, you know, I, my root tradition is insight meditation. A uh, lot of emphasis there on non-thinking, similar to Zen. So I had, you know, I would read about some of this stuff, and I just kept it at arm's bay for quite a while, and then for some reason I started doing it and was quite surprised at its power. Uh, and you're talking about a real felt sense. So we have, as I said at the beginning, we don't walk around with a philosophy about the self. This is my philosophy, but most of us, um, we have an innate. So we're talking about a gut feeling of the self, and that gut feeling turns out to be wrong. And so we go through, in this way, we go through a logical pr- process to have a gut feeling of its emptiness. And there's a real feeling with that. When you, uh, when you go through these and you really see it's empty, it will bring an emotional reaction. Now, it could be fear or sadness, as we talked about last, last or bereftness, as we talked about last night. But it could be joy and wonder and freedom and, and all of that. So it's an emotional thing that we're talking about. We're just using the logic to, go, to get through it. But in terms of self-fulfilling prophecy, no, because they're different things that we put in there. One is a, one is a, a, a faith in logic, and the other is, a, is taking the consequences of that faith in us. It's not, it's not that we've decided something at first. Uh, not that at all. Where is this practice from? If it's not um, you will f- well, the original place, as far as I'm aware, the original place it gets really discussed is in Chandrakirti's text called um, uh, the... Madhyamaka Vatara, which is uh, loosely translated as something like supplement to the middle way, or some entrance to the middle way, something like that, from the 7th century, and then picked up, uh, for the most part nowadays, by the Gelug Tibetan tradition as quite a central practice of their way of ref- seeing the emptiness of self. And outside of that, I don't really know that many people do it, outside of that tradition. So some, mm-hmm. somewhere like the Dalai Lama would be doing this a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. It would be one of his main, main practices, uh, really, really going into this. And if you, uh, it's interesting, if you, you pick up some, like the Dalai Lama, you can roughly divide his books in two. There are the very, very popular ones, where he just talks about kindness and everyone should be nice to each other. And then there are the ones that almost no one reads because they're going into this kind of logic. And he has a brilliant mind, a brilliant mind, philosophically and logically. A very, very smart guy. And he's been trained, you know, years and years of this kind of philosophy and this analysis, and they debate and they go into it. And so another half of his books are all about that and, uh, and quite rigorous on that front and uh, much less uh, selling, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's very, it, the Gelug, uh, as far as I know, I don't know anyone outside of that that really goes through it. It's also like a kind of come-around, though, in a way, isn't it? Because when they kind of come around, you're trying to find out you know, who you really are. And uh, you know, the more you look, the less you can find. And uh, you come to a point of intellectual exhaustion, really, which is it's like an emotional... Because I think we all go through that, at least as teenagers. We, we're trying to work out who the hell we are. You know? as, uh, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow night. I, I've never practised uh, much at all in the Zen tradition. <clears throat> My understanding, though, is actually it's not the same. It's something different. I'll talk more about this tomorrow night. What we're doing here is reaching a place of absolute clarity and knowing that something is empty, which is different than kind of throwing our hands up in the air and saying, we can't know, or um, it's unknowable, or, or something like that. So there's, as far as I understand, they're actually quite... Well, if, if you don't well, mind, I would like to address it tomorrow night, uh, because okay. it's part of a, part of a whole other... Except, except that, that you, I don't know if you're meaning that, but you, you don't throw up your hands in the air, you get to a place where... Um, you get to the, the bottom of the self, really, where you know you you, you are emptiness. Okay. So I don't know enough they, about it, 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 but it's, but it's much more of a struggle involved. Okay. Try, you know, to, 
like I said, I don't know enough about yeah. it, but it, it, might, it might be that. But what I really want to be clear about here is that we reach a point of kind of knowing something, and that the, because of the conviction in step two, that knowing has a real force to it, and it's like we really know something, and we know the lack of inherent existence of, of the self or anything else. We know the emptiness, and it's that clarity and penetration of the knowing that really is the power of this particular practice, which is, as I said, it's a different, there's many, many approaches to emptiness, and this is one particular way of going about it, different than what we've done so far and maybe maybe other ones. It's sort of like we're proving it to ourselves. Yeah, it's we're a proof. It to us. Yeah, absolutely, it's a we're proof. Our mind. Exactly. To ourselves. Exactly. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas at the time, short, short circuits or logical mind, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Now some. Yes. Exactly. Now some people say that what Nagarjuna, who first really sort of begun amplifying all the teachings on emptiness, up, up five, four, five hundred, what he's actually saying is you can't trust your thinking mind, um, and that's what emptiness is saying. That's actually not correct. It's actually if you read Nagarjuna again, it, it, brilliant, brilliant mind. I mean, uh, pff, un, unbelievably. Uh, sharp intellect and what he's doing is using the logical mind to prove that things can't exist inherently which is a different thing to saying reasoning is a waste of time uh, which sometimes people present as the teachings of emptiness uh, so you, you put it very well Ollie. it's exactly that it's really uh, having that yeah. at the end of the day it's what works for you though, absolutely it? yeah so we're just throwing something out what works but again I would say um, Absolutely what works for you. And as I said right at the beginning of the retreat, throwing lots of things out, find what works for you. The thing is, don't underestimate the incredible tenacity and power of delusion to find levels that things still inherently exist. Okay? So whatever we're doing, we have to make sure it thoroughly kind of cleans out uh, any possibility of inherent existence anywhere. And so sometimes we'll... Uh, have a feeling that something works for us, but it's actually not gone as fully deeply. So, so I've heard some people say, and I actually wonder whether it's a good thing, to actually sometimes practice in ways we don't feel like practicing, because maybe that will illuminate a corner that we otherwise wouldn't illuminate. So there's a kind of balance there between, yeah, following what works and really really flushing out the uh, the habit of the mind of delusion to keep... Making, giving something inherent existence. It will keep giving... Even when we say, say to someone, but I, but I don't feel like I'm giving anything inherent existence, unless we absolutely kind of see that it's empty of inherent existence, you can pretty much safely assume that delusion is finding some way. We might not consciously realize it, but delusion is finding some way to give something inherent existence. And that... Uh, that... Yeah, I would... I would uh, I In your opinion, is it... This, this seems very profound meditation and is it safe for anybody at any stage of their practice Thank you. to do yeah. something yeah. profound? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I, so this again goes back to the opening talk and the, and the talk on samadhi. I feel all of this is safe, I, I really do. Um, people, uh, let's say, one, one thing is the samadhi and, and the metta practices and they really, as I said before, they really act as cushions. I'm not sure how it works, maybe Virginia knows better, but if, if Geluk practitioners actually kind of warm up on chariots and cars and things like that and actually get used to it, and then when they're ready, begin themselves, I would feel that actually you're all, everyone in here is totally fine uh, doing it on themselves. Uh, helped by the samadhi, helped by the practices already that we're, as I said, when there's samadhi, when there's metta, when there's letting go, basically the self is getting quieter. And so we're getting more and more familiar with um, letting go of the self, rather than jumping from full-on self to z you know zero. Um, and even this practice, it's unlikely that it's going to kind of zap yourself first go off. You know, um, who knows? But um, uh, th there's a way that it's cushioned. Um, everyone in here has um, pretty solid mental health so far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, so I'm not I'm not really concerned about about anyone, and it's um, it, you, you will find some freedom opening up. It may, it may bring up some fear, but you can find fear comes up through samadhi practice, through anatta practice, through letting go. You know, it's it's 
part of the par, par for the course for 99.9% .9 of meditators sometimes that they, and it's okay, it's fine, it's really fine but yes, it's safe this is part of what you said last night I guess, about stretching and experimenting um, it can be, but I really don't want you to feel like you have to do this practice. So, um, but if you suggested not, it could be, it could be, yeah. More, I w yeah, it could be. I'm actually keeping it alive, and, and yeah, it could be part of that. Um, yes. Yes. Is, is there a way to know that um, you've exhausted all the possibilities for delusion not to be hiding somewhere? Yeah. Um, very important question. So it seems to me, like, yeah. Uh, I could see myself. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite I w sure I've exhausted well, it. No, I wouldn't worry about it right now. It, a, as the retreat goes on, we'll unfold uh, where delusion can be hiding. So, the, the way I go about this retreat, and it's hard for you to see it right now, but it relates to something I said in one of the early talks, is I divide the emptiness up into emptiness of the personal self. So, so far, most of what I've talked, not all, but most of what I've talked about is, is dealing with that emptiness of the personal self. And then there's emptiness of phenomena. Phenomena meaning uh, experiences and, and uh, chairs and cushions, but also Vedana and perceptions and consciousness. So they too are not just empty of being owned by someone, they're also empty in and of themselves. They too lack inherent existence. And like we said with the Anatta practice, it has a spectrum of subtlety. Uh, that too has a spectrum of subtlety. So one of the, well, I think it's fair to say, one, one of the last... One of the most subtle places that delusion can hide is giving inherent existence to awareness. Uh, that we tend to, to feel like, well, awareness must exist, otherwise nothing would exist, or time, or the more sort of taken for granted aspects of human existence. Uh, but we, we will get to that. We will get to that. So hopefully by the whole end of the retreat, you'll have a sense of any possibility where it could be. Mm. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, it's 9.33. <laughs> um, let's, have, let's be quiet together for a bit now. <clears throat> Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.